You've tuned in to the most crazy rocking metal podcast on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metal from the Inside. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 17 of the Metal from the Inside podcast, hosted by yours truly, Sydney Taylor. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode and joining me for another week. I've missed you guys so much. I was actually on vacation last week, so I decided to take the week off, but I am back this week with a brand new interview for you guys. I'm very excited, as always, for you guys to dive in and listen to it. But first off, I wanted to chat about the brand new Metal from the Inside logo that I debuted last week on all of our social medias. I was so happy with how this logo ended up turning out. I really had a vision in my head for what I wanted to be included on the logo and the graphic designer I worked with really knocked it out of the park. I really wanted elements that made heavy metal what it is on the logo, um, especially old school metal. So I included a cassette on there as well as the iconic devil horns or metal horns, however you describe them. Um, And overall, I think it just came out really well and I think represents what Metal from the Inside is all about. So if you haven't seen the brand new logo, be sure to go to all of our social medias to check it out. We're on Instagram at Metal from the Inside and on Twitter at MFTI Official. We are also on Facebook at Metal from the Inside as well. So you can go ahead and check out the new logo there. We're also in the process of updating the website as well. So there is a lot coming to Metal from the Inside and I am so thrilled that all of you are on this journey with me. So I've also been thinking about the possibility of releasing some merch with the brand new logo, so please feel free to let me know if merch is something that you would be interested in, whether it's on a shirt, on a vinyl mat, stickers, whatever you guys would be into. Please let me know. Uh, Tweet me. Go ahead and send me an email. I'd love to hear your thoughts, and if this is something that you would actually want to purchase, please feel free to let me know. I've been thinking about the idea. I really love how the logo came out, and I think it would look great on some shirts at least for you guys to rep if you love the Metal from the Inside podcast, so let me know and I will keep you guys up to date on that as I continue down that process. But let's get back to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I have an interview for you guys with guitarist Kane Roberts who played with Alice Cooper and wrote with Alice on the Constrictor and Raise Your Fist and Yell albums that were released in 1986 and 1987. Kane has also done work with Desmond Child and Paul Stanley as well, writing some songs with Paul and he's also done a bunch of his own solo work. So Kane has been in the music industry for years now. We actually go deeper into Kane's history in the interview as well, so you guys are going to get to hear everything that Kane was up to before he joined with Alice, but Kane's story is so incredible because he went from just being a guitar player recording demos late at night and pretty much playing any gig he could to eventually touring with one of Rock's biggest acts, Mr. Alice Cooper, in the mid-80s when Alice was recording his comeback records, and Kane was such a huge part in running these records as well. I feel like a lot of people aren't when 100% aware of just how involved Kane was in the writing process for Constrictor and Razor Fist and Yell. So he was a giant part of Alice's history regarding those two records. And I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this week's interview. Kane is always a blast to speak to and it's going to be a great episode. But as always, before we get right into the interview, I'm going to fill you guys in on everything that's been going on in the hard rock and heavy metal world recently. First up, Whitesnake's Slip of the Tongue lineup, which of course features David Coverdale, Rudy Sarzo, Adrian Vandenberg, Steve Vai, and the one and only Tommy Aldridge just reunited this past Wednesday when they did a virtual question and answer session, and this Q&A actually took place before a live stream of Whitesnake's iconic Live at Donington show that took place in 1990. If you guys are familiar with me and my favorite bands, you would know that Slip of the Tongue is one of my favorite records. Now You're Gone is one of my all-time, or actually is my all-time favorite Whitesnake track, but I love that record and that show is so iconic, so I was so excited when they announced that they were doing this question and answer and live stream. The record celebrated its 30th anniversary last year as it was released in 1989 and they actually came out with a bunch of different remastered versions of the record and even a seven disc box set that you can still purchase. So if you love Slip of the Tongue just as much as me, you can go ahead and purchase those remasters in that box set and I'm pretty sure you can still view the live stream 
of the question and answer and live at Donington as well. So if you missed it, go ahead and check it out because it was certainly amazing for all of us White Snake fans. If you collect or rather hoard rock merchandise like me, I'm sure you own a fair amount of the Funko Pops that came out a couple of years ago. These are pretty much bobbleheads that you can purchase of movie characters, comic book characters, book characters, musicians. Um, if somebody is famous, odds are they have a Funko Pop made after them. But today, Twisted Sister frontman D. Snyder actually announced that Funko Pop is designing and creating a D. Snyder Funko Pop for you guys to purchase. And I love over the last couple of years that Funko Pop has included a ton more of rock musicians in their merchandise. You can purchase Slash, Lemmy, the Motley Crue members. I have a bunch of Alice Cooper Funko Pops as well. And I love that they are continuing this with adding D. Snyder to the collection. So be sure to stay tuned on D social media so you can be one of the first people to know when the Funko Pop actually drops for you to purchase. I know sometimes they make these Funko Pops as a limited edition so you can only purchase it uh, during a certain time frame or at a certain store. So go ahead and keep yourself updated so when pre-orders hit you can be one of the first to take part in it. Next up we have a fun story that came out this week about Iron Maiden guitarist Adrian Smith who actually had a very close encounter with the band Def Leppard about possibly joining after the death of guitarist Steve Clark. And this happened during Smith's absence from Iron Maiden, which occurred in 1990. But as we all know, Adrian never actually joined Def Leppard. John Sykes, who was a guitarist with Whitesnake at one point, was also in the running for joining Def Leppard. But as we all know, the one who made the cut was Vivian Campbell, who we know from playing with Ronnie James Dio in the early 80s, and also Whitesnake. He was in Whitesnake for a short period of time. He actually ended up getting the spot as guitarist in Def Leppard. But Adrian didn't share too much about this as he stated that he plans on including the full story of this in one of his future books. So if you are really a Def Leppard fan and would love to hear more about the possibility of Iron Maiden's Adrian Smith joining the band, be sure to stay tuned for whenever Adrian releases his next book because the story will be in there. It's really fascinating because I don't think I could ever see Adrian Smith playing in Def Leppard, but I love hearing these stories of so many different guitarists and musicians possibly joining other bands. I know I talked about it a couple episodes ago when the story came out about Nuno Betancourt getting an offer to play with Ozzy Osbourne and then turning it down. Um, I love hearing stories like that from behind the scenes, so stay tuned for Adrian's book to hear more about that story, but very interesting. Speaking of Def Leppard, we just celebrated the 33rd anniversary of the band's 1987 record, Hysteria, and I know that that is often pegged as the band's most commercial release, but it also does remain one of their most iconic records. I I personally do prefer the earlier Def Leppard records such as High and Dry and Pyromania. I'd probably say that Pyromania is my favorite just because it was the record that got me into Def Leppard and just has a special place in my heart, but there is no denying that Hysteria is the more commercial record of Def Leppard's 80s releases. But that being said, I think it's super important to note that the production of Hysteria was really an influence to so many records afterwards. You know, Mutt Lang was the producer for Def Leppard's records in the 80s and he especially Ashley did a fantastic production job on Hysteria. Even though that is a controversial statement, the production of that record was an incredible influence to the industry and the way that albums were produced in the future in not only the hard rock and heavy metal genre, but genres all over from pop to country and everything in between. It was a major influence and there is no denying that. So happy 33rd birthday to Def Leppard's Hysteria. Go ahead and give that record a spin. Sadly, last Last week, we lost Pete Way, legendary bassist for the band UFO. According to Way's official Facebook page, Pete sadly passed away due to injuries he sustained in a life-threatening accident that took place around two months ago, which is so devastating. His passing really came out of the blue and shocked so many, including myself. Pete played on UFO records dating from 1970 to 2006, so he was such a major player in UFO and on all of their releases. Pete was a part of some of UFO's biggest records, including Phenomenon and Lights Out. He also played on one of the greatest live albums of all time, Strangers in the Night. That album is definitely in my top five favorite live albums. Overall, we are just so sad for the loss of Pete, and I'm sending so much love to his family and his friends, and especially his band members that I'm sure this was a shock to as well, and pretty much everyone he's influenced over the years. UFO was a major influence to pretty much every rock band of every subgenre. UFO is 
often cited as being an influence for thrash bands such as Megadeth and Metallica and just so many bands. They were one of the heaviest groups of that time so their music really reached a wide variety of hard rock and heavy metal fans and influenced so many musicians that went on to do amazing things of their own. So we really are so sad and by the loss of Pete and are continuing to send love to his family and friends during this really, really, really difficult time. That's just a little glimpse into everything that's been going on in the hard rock and heavy metal world this past week. If you'd like to see even more rock news, be sure to go to www.metalfromtheinside.com and click on our news section to see up-to-date releases and even more rock news. As I mentioned before, this week's interview on the Metal From The Inside podcast is with guitarist Kane Roberts. We talk all about Kane's early years before he joined Alice Cooper in the mid-80s. We chat about some of his time with Alice, such as his experiences writing with him and being on tour, as well as being the musical director of the Alice Cooper show and really tying in some important pieces of the live show in the mid-80s on the Nightmare Returns tour. We also get into Kane's most recent record entitled The New Normal that was released in January of 2019 and how the album cover is eerily a kind of foreshadow of what was to come in the year 2020. It's always such a pleasure getting to chat with Kane and I'm so grateful that over the years we have formed a friendship. I'm really so grateful and so honored to be able to speak with the people who have created my favorite music and quite honestly the soundtrack to my life and also even be able to call them a friend. So I'm really really thankful to have Kane on the podcast and to continue to share these conversations with you guys. Without further ado, let's hop into this week's interview with Mr. Kane Roberts. Enjoy you guys. So hello everybody. Thanks for joining me on this week's episode of the Metal from the Inside podcast. I am here with the fantastic Kane Roberts who not only played on the legendary Alice Cooper albums, Constrictor and Razor Fist and Yell, but was also a co-writer and has worked with a myriad of artists throughout his career, uh, writing and uh, playing with them just throughout the years. Um, Kane and I have had the opportunity to chat before in the past, and I'm so excited that he wanted to come on the podcast this week. Um, I'm very thankful that we can now call each other friends. We've kind of stayed in touch over the years. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited to have you on the podcast this week. How are you doing? Hey, good to see you again, Sydney. You, uh, you having fun? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having fun sitting in my house, uh, not seeing music and social distancing. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's funny, like, uh, you know, I have so many friends that were actively touring, and that was kind of how they, they made their, their money. So, um, and it's also, you know, it was the sort of, uh, the realization of their dreams since they were little kids, you know? And so the thing is, uh, you know, I was talking to Kip Winger and he was saying, we went through a similar thing. You know, it was, you know, you're of the mind that things are just going to last forever. Uh, these numbers are a little antiquated because it was back in, you know, way, way back in the day. But, you know, my first record deal was a quarter of a million dollars uh, on MCA and, I was touring with Alice and writing with Alice Cooper. I mean, suddenly I went from dealing cards with this uh, totally illegal blackjack game in Manhattan to sitting on uh, a beach in, in Maui at Chef Gordon's house. And Alice and I are hanging out and he would go golfing in the morning. Like we'd, I'd wake up and he would already be golfing because, you know, the golf courses in Maui are incredible, especially uh, Kihei, which is where we were. You know, I'd find the gym, I'd go work out. And then he'd come back and I'd come back and we'd hang out for the whole day writing and recording and we found studios and stuff like that. So, you know, I thought this is my, this is going to be my life, you know, for, for, for the rest of uh, time. And, you know, then we do a tour, we do an album. I was in a couple of movies, you know, it was just a whole crazy scene. And then suddenly, you know, for whatever reasons, everybody's uh, sort of stressed over it and analyzed it, but, you know, the culture changed in terms of music. And so white rock was no longer acceptable. And, you know, it was grunge. And then it was, that was pushed out just for rap. So it turned into a thing where I had to reconfigure, you know? So uh, same thing with, with Kip. Kip, Kip was uh, opening for Cinderella and they were doing, you know, pretty big venues, you know, like Long Beach Arena. And, and he was right about to headline. That's where he was. He had some platinum albums and he was ready to go. And of course, everything changed. And, you know, the whole thing with Beavis and Butthead and, and Metallica drummer throwing darts at his picture and stuff. I don't know what the fuck that was about. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard news. Now, you know, everybody did different things. 
I went on to other stuff. I wasn't about to get, you know, tattoos and get some shorts and, you know, try to bang my head and stuff. I didn't want to go, you know, even though I thought the music was unbelievable. I thought, I, I really loved their art. Um, not that they did that, but Tan Pantera or any of these bands that came out, I thought they were incredible. So, but I went on to do other stuff, you know, mostly in, in broadcast design and, and motion graphics. And Kip, I remember a couple of years, I think it was 93, 94, I asked him what he was doing. And he said, I'm playing at Borders tonight. And I said, the, the bookstore? And he goes, yeah. And I said, what's that like? And he goes, well, you know, not too many people are paying attention. I'm just playing while people are drinking coffee and talking and everything. I admired that. I thought to myself, that's somebody who's so passionately involved. Like he defines himself as, as a musician 24-7, 100%. And that's, that's what he did. Now, I sort of fancy myself as the same. I, that's how I define myself. That's what all my dreams were when I was a kid. But I, the business industry, the business part of it, the, the music industry, uh, I just, you know, I, I wasn't that excited about. But I mean, all that stuff ended, you know, although there's a little bit of a resurgence happening now. Of course, that's gone. But I have friends that are just in current bands. I mean, you know, you, you not that these people haven't made a lot of money, but, you know, Billie Eilish is about to do her biggest tour, of, you know, of the year of anybody. The, for, this was going to be the biggest event of the year. Right. Um, you think of Orianthi just about to tour with Michael Jackson. You know, these are all really incredibly talented people. And, you know, uh, you know, bands that were touring in front of 80,000 people and all that stuff. Now, you know, that's going to be gone for quite a while. I think, I think that the, the, the point is that you have to hold on to your creativity, hold on to your dreams and everything, and just you have to keep moving forward because you, you have no other choice. So, But it's kind of an unusual scene these days, isn't it? Um, we've even talked about this, you know, off camera and things. Um, just seeing what people have come up with, like during yeah. this time period, you know, even in these couple of months, I mean, like, yes, nothing record breaking or whatever has come in these last couple of months, but just seeing collaborations between people and, and different things that have been going on, um, live stream things that nobody had thought of back in January of this year right. that are, are coming to fruition. Um, so even though we're kind of out of touch physically and in that, you know, personal way that we're all used to, I think that, you know, like we've discussed before, um, something's going to come and something's going to be revolutionary that will eventually, yeah. you know, if, if we can't get back to the uh, normal right away, you know, eventually mm -hmm. we'll, we'll find a way to make it work, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, um, for example, uh, there's certain people uh, that are involved in the sort of uh, broadcast aspect of music or A&R people at record companies and, and people that interview. And people that, that are sort of, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, are an essential part of the whole process, even though it seems like it's on the periphery. But in, in truth, it, it's, it's right in the nexus of all that stuff. I think, you know, people like you and, and my friend uh, uh, Michael Alago, for example, he just did a radio show. It's fantastic. People are going to start going back to that sort of grassroots way of, of experiencing music. And you'll see the culture will adjust. And because, you know, there's money to be made, somebody's going to figure something out, like you just said. There's going to be a technology that would allow it and so people have to just keep their eyes open for it and and do everything you can i, I was going to do this uh, live stream uh, thing with somebody but uh, you know it looks like it, it may not happen now but i think that's one of the the greatest uh things that you know that that's one of the greatest things people can do is is find other ways to um to drill into the public and give them what they're looking for you know the other danger is you know out of sight out of mind and people will move on so you have to keep yourself you got to do as much face time as you can so you know you've been in the industry for years now and you've gotten to experience it with the way things were back in the 80s and even earlier and you've gotten to experience it from you know then to what it is like now but i know in most interviews and cases when people talk to you they like to just dive kind of into the alice stuff but sure we've talked about this before and i really kind of wanted to get an idea of how you started because I feel like that's something that I'm not super knowledgeable on and I, you know, right. I'm curious to know, you know, how did you just get started in, in playing and, you know, eventually wanting to pursue it as a career? Because I know everybody has different catalysts. Um, I've talked to plenty of people who just started out in completely different ways. Um, so I'm curious just to hear kind of your story and your history. I, I think my story is, is, um, 
it's probably it's it, it the the sort of uh, the elements around it are very unusual. You know, as soon as I picked up a guitar as a little kid, I remember my parents uh, for Christmas got me a bike. You know, and they got me these other toys that I wanted. And there was this guitar there, this K guitar. It literally weighed five hundred pounds. You know, for me because I was such a little kid. <laughs> But that's where I went. I ran past the bike. I ran past all the toys, um, all the Barbie dolls. No, I couldn't. No, they didn't give me. <laughs> but no, but I, I, I ran right for the uh, for the guitar. And from that moment on, uh, that's what I wanted to do. So there's a lot of naysayers in life. You know, it, it doesn't matter what we're trying to do. If you're trying to step out of the box at all and be some sort of a uh, entrepreneur, quote unquote, so for yourself and get some sort of personal fame, uh, personal income, whatever it might be, you know, there's going to be a lot of people saying, well, you know, why is it going to work for you and not for someone else? So what happens is at a very young age, I was dreaming about doing all this stuff, about everything. I remember I was, uh, I was dealing cards at this uh, illegal blackjack jack game in New York. You know, I would uh, play at a club, make very little money. You know, it was, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but it was, uh, you know, rock night at a strip club, you know, that sort of a thing. And we would, um, and it was all originals, by the way. We would do a couple of cover songs, but I was never in a cover band. I just, I always felt, thought that that was a good way to sort of kick yourself out of the potential of learning what it is you ultimately want to want to do. So I just didn't do that. If I did a cover song, it's just because I loved it and I knew the audience would like it or something like that. But predominantly, we're always uh, original. So I would go to this place and I go to, it was a different hotel conference room all over the city. So the police couldn't track it down. And I would walk in and this guy uh, would show me where all the guns were. He like opened up a cabinet and goes, you got one there and you got one over here. You know, and they, and they were Italian, not that it's a you know, big deal. But <laughs> I would sit down and deal cards and it would be, be till literally till five in the morning. And you see this really strange sort of Adams family group in front of you too, you know, that late at night. And if I kept losing, you know, you could tell that the guys running the game would start getting a little pissed off. There were, there were two other uh, dealers. So, um, and then there was one guy that would come in and just, have me and him at a table and he would bet on every circle and he would bet you know money for me as well i found out later that he was actually a hitman so i you know i'm glad i didn't become his buddy you know that sort of thing i didn't make him angry you know if i if he loses too much you know it's probably easy for him to like when i got uh, i was doing demos you know like everybody does and and by the way i still do this i will ask anybody for anything there's something i need you know the the i almost uh, for my last video i almost um i tried to get in touch with oliver stone i wanted him to either edit it or direct it you have to feel like you know whatever it is you want you have to make the request you have to ask you know so i would go sneak into studios i'd say can i come in for free and they'd say okay but you got to get here at one in the morning and i guess i'd buy a, uh, a, an assistant engineer somebody that was learning or an intern uh, you know, I'd buy him a pizza or whatever, you know, and I would record stuff. Finally, somebody heard it, and I was suddenly sitting in front of, um, you know, Bob Ezrin, and Alice was in the next room, and Chef Gordon, and all these, you know, massive uh, uh, movers and shakers of, of culture and music and, and all sorts of stuff. So, and by the way, I'd never met Alice. So, you know, some of the imagery of Alice Cooper, I mean, I think I had just seen a video where he was in Paris. This is back in, the, I think it was the 70s. And he was just hammered off his ass and they were doing uh, 18. And it was one of the most incredible important performances I'd ever seen. I was saying like, this guy is nothing but real. And at one point he just kind of fell on his ass, he had his leg up and he's still singing incredible, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking like, what is this guy going to be like when I meet him? <laughs> so, you know, after, uh, after Esmond runs me through the riot act on what to expect, you know, it was almost like going in the army where they break you down and then try to build you up as a soldier. You know, he said to me, Kane, you're 50% of a great writing team. And I said, well, I thought it was 58 but that's fine. So he sent me into the next room and, um, you know, Alice and I became best friends within 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And we were joking and laughing. Of course, everybody noticed. And so Shep's main thing is he's looking out for Alice. Of course, he wants him to be successful and he's brilliant in making the right moves. And at that point, you know, Alice had come out of rehab and this is all stuff that I was unaware of. So he had come out of rehab and, uh, you know, I was, uh, I wasn't that big in those days, but you could tell I didn't do any drugs. I didn't, didn't drink or anything. And I think that was a plus. And we just started working right away. 
and you know, I, I mentioned this before, but you know, I remember Shep uh, sent Alice to Maui, uh, to Maui uh, Shep's house. It's right on the beach. You go out the back door and there's a little lawn. You go down a couple of, you know, some steps and you're on the beach, you're right on the water. There's an island there, and that's where the sunset takes place every night. So that was it was like paradise, you know. But the first thing I had to do was meet Shep. So he flies me out, and I'm at Shep's house. You know, I had, I hadn't smoked marijuana in a hundred years, you know. So I um, he came out, and you know, I hadn't I'd never met him before. And he's like, hey, kid, you know, you doing? He's a very tall guy, low low voice, you know, super low voice. And he goes, oh, you want to hit? And so I kind of was a little nervous, so I said, sure, yeah, I, I can play, you know, I'm pretty good, you know, I, I took one hit, like, a, and then, you know, gave it back to him, I got so destroyed, I mean, I, I was so high, I didn't know what he was saying, I didn't know what I was saying, and I noticed that there was a pool, so I said, you know, it's February, and so I was unaware that, uh, you know, in February, you don't really heat the pool, it's freezing, okay, and they just leave it that way until things start to warm up and everything. But I didn't know that. So uh, he said, uh, so I said, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll take a dip, you know. So I was wearing shorts, you know, and I went out back and I jumped in the pool. I'm at the bottom of it. It was like a, being like immersed in an ice cube, you know, I'm like screaming underwater, you know, that sound. It was pretty humorous. But by the time I got out to, to Maui, um, you know, Alice and I were, were, were just seriously like, you know, rocking and we started writing a lot of Constrictor. So I, I know that's one of your favorite records. So, uh, that Alice did. Um, and, and that's where, you know, the first thing we wrote, now, believe it or not, was life and death of the party, which ended up being one of my favorites. And I also, also was very proud of the solo because the solo seemed to have sort of a real spirited structure to it and everything but that's that's sort of how that's that's everything and then you know the other stuff that happened the tours and all that that's all very new to me so you know uh everything was just so exciting for 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 those years then i got the record deal with geffen and you know uh it, it sort of came out right at the sort of uh, juncture where everything changed like i was saying before that was a lesson to be learned you know which i i you know i sort of put in my pocket and moved on so yeah of course, you know, you said that you had seen that video of Alice. Um, you hadn't really had, like, a lot of knowledge on him. You had seen that one video of him. Um, I think mm. I know what you're talking about. Was it, like, it was, like, the early 70s, right? I, and it was him just... And, and it's <laughs> it black like, and white. Yeah. Right. It, such a perfect band. I mean, I mean, the, the way Dennis and everybody looked, it, they were a backdrop, but they were an essential part of it. And, of course, Neil is, was the ultimate rock star. You know, you just you couldn't get around it. And in front of them, was this guy that was probably every single level of what parents hated, you know, and, and he's drunk and he's singing unbelievable, you know, like with Alice Cooper. So, you know, you can see why he made his mark. So what were you listening to, you know, when you were starting to, to play guitar and you were, you know, discovering that music was a passion for you? Like, did you have an artist that you listened to that you, you know, were super fond of? Like, for me, the artist that made me want to go into music was Alice. Like, did you have an artist like that? Or were you just inspired by, you know, what you were listening to at the time as a whole? Well, well, you know, I, I'm still like this to this day. I, I listen to a, a tremendous amount of music, a lot of different styles. Like, you know, uh, I think Arch Enemy is, is one of the best bands out there. Very, you know, incredible standard. Of course, Alyssa is unreal in terms of her ability and her standard and methods of working and everything. But, you know, I'll, I'll listen to, like I said, Billie Eilish. I'll listen to a lot, a lot of stuff. And, and back then, um, you know, for me, it was... Uh, it was Led Zeppelin, and I thought Jimmy Page, uh, the you know, what really affected me, and, you know, I, I can kind of see that now, is he was such a composer, like the riffs that he wrote. Of course, his solos, maybe his chops weren't, you know, like an Eddie Van Halen or somebody that just, you know, could shred or play things perfectly, but he had that same uh, uh, sort of magic that, that Slash has in that, in the middle of his solo, you're expecting him to mess it up or break a string or something. There's this tension of reality of how there's so much chaos in, in life and so many things can go right or wrong. It just reflects the way life is. But they end up playing the perfect stuff, you know. So uh, Jimmy Page was big for me. Of course, Jimi Hendrix. And then, um, you know, I went through a period where I was listening to jazz a lot. There's a guy named Sonny Rollins. Like, when I was a kid, like 17, I used to follow them around, you know. Uh, go sneak into clubs and see him play and he recognized me you know 
And there was one night, uh, you know, he, he walked off the stage at a club and he just starts playing. Of course, it's the most incredible saxophone ever. You know, him and Coltrane were the, the two guys, um, although uh, Coltrane had died by then. But, you know, Sonny came over to my table and put the um, bell of the saxophone on my shoulder. So I, that freaked me out because I looked at him and he winked at me. You know, I was like, oh, this is crazy. So, but I thought like what that happened to me at that moment was I felt really blessed, you know, like, like to love music and to see what mu musicians it can be like and all that stuff. So um, that was sort of, you know, the way it was going. Of course, you know, the, the, big, uh, the big moment for a lot of people, a lot of humbling moments was the arrival of Eddie Van Halen. And of course, you know, you either take that and get depressed and leave or you sit there and you learn. And, and that's what I ended up. I ended up doing I just kept you know studying what, what other guitar players were doing and, and learning that way and then you know just recent more recently um, you know Steve Vai kind of you know tore my head off with with what he does in his standard and, and how great he is so there's a lot of great musicians out there I mean I'm missing a million great guitar players but but you know those were sort of the main guys yeah it's interesting to see you know and in being influenced by somebody like Jimmy Page um, and your style kind of evolved from you know being more of I guess like a classic player like that too you kind of got more into like the, sh the shreddy vibe or like the, the mm -hmm. world of playing very fast it was like that style that kind of came um, into fruition you know with the Eddie Van Halen and like the late 80s time period so when did you kind of realize that you liked to play that way you know because obviously it wasn't something that was always a huge style you know during the 70s and like the early 80s but you know you got to the late 80s and pretty much you know playing that way was was very big so how did you discover that that you enjoyed like that kind of guitar playing and that you well, were really it, good at it. Yeah, no, it, it turned into like, for example, uh, Dazed and Confused had a solo that was, he put a Leslie effect on it, but it was kind of a shred solo. And so m my thought was to try to play that solo and play it perfectly. In other words, I, I was one of those guys that I was looking for some sort of uh, technical perfection. So I would practice and practice and practice. And hopefully when I would perform, none of those thoughts would be in my head. It would just be sort of a natural event. So the, the better my skills got, the easier it was for me to play whatever it is I heard. And so, you know, and, and there were guys that, there was a guy, Alvin Lee, that played very fast stuff. And there were other guys that just played very fast that I, that I heard. But it wasn't until I heard uh, Eddie that it was sort of assembled into a very musical, very artistic, very creative, and, and uh, sort of a perfect way for, for the song. So I think that was also not just his technique and not sort of the revolutionary stuff that he was doing and his sound and everything, but you know how it was compositional and it worked with the songs. I mean, if you listen to my, my latest record and you know even the, the, the earlier ones that I did, I really wanted the guitar part to really have something to do with the song and if there was a song that the guitar solo uh didn't um wasn't necessary then i wouldn't do one um you know one of the songs that i i'm pretty sure you like is he's back and if you listen to that solo there's no effort to shred there's no effort to do right. anything sort of outrageous i just wanted to do something that sort of slithered in and out of the music and just leave it you know for alice to carry it and and you know, that's one of the things, you know, if you're a side man, you, you have to know when to, uh, um, you know, sort of step out or, you know, step back. I mean, anybody that saw the live shows then, I really picked my spots when I would go to the edge of the stage. So we, um, uh, we played uh, on the Raise Your Fist and Yell tour. There was a, uh, the, the Gale, the uh, Ra Roses on White Lace and, and Gale and Prince of Darkness had a little section in it where Alice would come in. Come in. This was part of the theater. And this beautiful prostitute would walk out on the stage smoking a cigarette and just showing off, you know. And she would lean against the lamppost and Alice would come out with this big blade and the crowd would go crazy, you know, and he'd walk up behind her as if he's going to stab her. And then he would look at the audience and they would just explode into, you know, they wanted him to do this incredibly radical, violent, bloody act on a, a, a violence on, on, on stage. So it was that way every night. And then of course he'd slit her throat and blood splattered all over the place. When we played Italy, we're in a very big venue and that song starts. And of course the crowd's fully into it, you know, the prostitute comes out and the, the cheer is like incredible, but for her, you know, and then Alice comes out with a knife and he looks like he's gonna stab her. And I, I looked at the audience and it got silent. And then he looks at the audience like this and they were like, no, <laughs> you know, 
So he does it again. And they're like, no, no, no. You know, this big crowd yelling and everything. So Alice cuts his throat and a complete riot takes place. Like fights and everybody's going, people are climbing onto the stage trying to get at Alice. And there was one crew guy that runs across the stage and pushes a guy off the stage. As he leaves, he grabs his shirt and pulls the crew guy into the audience. And he got jacked up. I mean, when, when he finally made it back to the uh, backstage, his shoes were gone, his shirt was all torn up, he had a black eye. And so to show you what I was like then, I walked to the edge of the stage. So uh, Alice had to back up because it was getting kind of scary. And I was right on the edge with my feet. And the audience, although they had gotten very uh, kind of chaotic and, and it was like a riot, um, they really appreciated that I did that. So everybody was grabbing at my legs and all sorts of things. It turned into like a really cool thing. So that, that was the sort of energy in those days because I was extremely hyper. So I, I kind of got off on it that way. So that was one of those examples of like, maybe it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but you know, I stepped out in front of everybody. I thought at a, like the right time to try to keep the show together. a little. What was it like for you to be, you know, around all these theatrics? Because obviously that's Alice's thing. And I'm sure that you, you know, weren't really dealing with that before you met Alice and, you know, joined the band. So what was it like to, you know, go out on stage and have it be not just you playing or uh, just playing a show for people, but having it kind of be like a storyline? Well, I was the music director. No, no, I'm kidding. No, but I, they, they, had, they had made me the music director. So, you know, I became very aware of the script. They would hand me the script. This is going to happen. We want this to happen. Where can we put this in the song? So if you listen to it, when Alice is getting his head chopped off, like let's say on the first tour, the, the, the Nightmare Returns, you can hear that there's music there for those moments. So it was the first time I'd ever done that. But it, it was almost easy only because, you know, I watched a lot of their old, you know, videos and stuff, VHS and stuff like that. And, and I, I saw that you want to pick the proper song and then arrange the music so that it becomes a soundtrack for this in incredible character you know that that is gonna is gonna die you know and and the the beauty of it is in every film it's called the hero's journey there's this <clears throat> a guy named joseph campbell who wrote this book and of course you know um you know uh, george lucas went to him as he was developing uh, star wars and what it is is basically even though there's all these myths and fables for every culture from you know africa everywhere you, you know europe wherever the stories are all the same and it's basically an ordinary life. You get a challenge to do something, to save the world, and you turn it down. And then a crisis pushes you so that you have no choice but to join the fight. And then, of course, at the end, you die, and then you're resurrected. So, you know, you look at Star Wars. There was Luke. Um, he lived on a farm with his, his uh, relatives. He goes out, and Obi-Wan Kenobi says, hey, you have to save the world. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he goes back, and he, the stormtroopers have killed his family. So that's the crisis, and now he's on, uh, you know, this, this mission. And, you know, uh, in The Matrix, it's the same thing. Keanu's working at this place, and he finally, and at the end, he dies, and uh, uh, Carrie Moss kisses him. And he comes back to life. He's resurrected. And now he's got new, he's a bigger hero. You know, that right. sort of a thing. That's his total character result. So that's what Alice did on, on, the, on stage. You know, he would, he'd go through this whole sort of uh, storyline of all these songs. And these, this was the pressure that I was under. And then he would die. And then he would come back, you know. And when he came back, you know, of course, he's got this white tuxedo now. So he's resurrected as this pure, you know, with Alice's case, pure evil. And, and he would come back and, and, you know, you can't get rid of the guy. He's, he's now like the, the super anti-hero sort of guy. So writing all that stuff uh, was easy only because Alice and I had decided to make it a heavy show. We didn't want people to think that, you know, and of course in the industry, they're brutal. You know, we didn't want them to think that, you know, Alice just survived rehab. He came back as a sort of a bionic version, a nuclear version. And, you know, when I read some of the reviews, you know, of the, when the record came out, they were so aware that Alice was no longer drinking and he was no longer doing drugs, you know? And so they were very cruel about it. They were saying, oh, you know, he needs to, he needs to go back on drugs, you know, and all that sort of a thing. It's, it's, it, was, it was just like, instead of realizing that it's his genius that, that made him great, not, you know, the, the sort of uh, the drugs or anything that he was taking, the recreational stuff that he was doing. And it wasn't until the tour happened that people realized that, you know, 
Alice is is all shades of real, you know. So um, so yeah, it was it was kind of an interesting job to have, and I, I think uh, I think we succeeded. You know, I think the Nightmare of Returns. Uh, there were some things about that that I thought were superlative, and then the same thing with Raise Your Fist and Yell. Of course, the band was a lot better at that point, not because of different personnel, but we'd already done a tour. So and it's so cool too because you were you know one of the first people to get to write with Alice when he you know had come back. Other than Bernie Taupin, I don't know if anybody else had written with him when he was yeah. sober um, and you know completely like clear-headed I am really got to experience what you know his mind was like you know without alcohol or, or whatever so it's it, I just think it's so cool it really shows on those two records you know just how Alice's old style was still there but you know mm. he still had all of the, the funny lyrics and and the the evilness and you know everything that was Alice Cooper but sure. you know, for sure. you it must have been you, I know you weren't like super knowledgeable on everything that he had been dealing with but you know for you it must have been interesting to work with him after discovering you know that he had kind of gone through all of that the the, the thing about it was for me that uh I just, when I see somebody, you know, right away when we were working together, you know, it, it, we had the strange underpinning of real friendship. But beyond that, I could recognize how brilliant the guy was. And, you know, and, and you know, I, so I let those moments happen. Like, I didn't have to get my fingers in everything. One, one interesting thing that I haven't really told a lot of people is, you know, when we first started writing, Ezrin had to be there to make to see. He was the judge and jury. And he didn't like me. So, you know, he was suspicious of anybody coming in and taking advantage of, of Alice, you know? And so, uh, you know, we're going back and forth. And I remember there was one time, uh, you know, he and I used to, you know, go at it a little bit, you know? So at one time he had his uh, feet up on the coffee table. So I was coming around the corner and when I got to his feet, he, he legs, he wouldn't move his legs. I, I said, you're gonna move your legs? And he goes, you're gonna step over him? I said, if I step over him, I might fall and break your kneecaps. It's, it's up to you. So he liked that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the type of guy Bob is. He's like, you know, these guys are, some of these guys are tough guys, you know, and if you fuck with them, you know, they, they get it, you know. They're not afraid of somebody who's abrasive. A guy that I met just recently like that was Serafino from, from Frontiers. I mean, um, he's a total badass, but he's, a, he's the real deal in terms of passion for music. So, you know, at the end of my tenure with Frontiers, you know, I'm sure he fucking hates me. But I really like the guy because because you know he's a tough guy and and he's 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 really talented and he you know he, he's a straight shooter with business you know and that's what I thought about um you know all these people like you know Alice and Shep and all those guys because they had done so much and they had seen so much so uh, with Alice I would step back and I would just let him r ride if you listen to the lyrics on um, Prince of Darkness you'll you'll see what I mean that was like 15 minutes for him and it it's a real story. It's a script to a movie that he just blew right out, like sitting on the couch eating Doritos. So, and I think it's because of the Doritos. I had laced them with a certain type of PCP. No, I'm kidding. No, that's a Dorito story, by the way. That's not an Alice story. It's it's very interesting to hear about what his process was like before and then what it was like then. And to also hear how involved you were in the writing on those two records, because, you know, not only did you do those two records with Alice, but then you eventually went on to do your own solo record yeah and the one that i believe was released in 87 um and then you had saints and sinners as well um and you've gone on to release other records as well recently the new normal came out in 2019 and i wanted to touch mm. on that too because i mm. you know it's still very recent and you still have some stuff uh, being released from that record but i know from like the late 90s to you know maybe i guess when you released the new normal you kind of had done some album work here and there but stepped away from the industry a little bit you know what made you want to come out with a new record and kind of get back into you know what is now the modern day music industry well see i you know i always wanted to make a record it's just that you know first of all you know where was i going to go and like i said my first record deal was uh, was 250 grand and then you know i got this you know massive you know for me i got a massive uh, publishing deal and now so so the dollar signs were very big and it had a it had a tendency to sort of you know mollify me or calm me down in terms of you know all the sort of you know ripoffs going on all over the place and not not with you know the management company not with Shep or any of those people or Alice they were very generous but just the the, the other sort of level with record companies and radio stations and all that stuff it, a lot of it had gotten kind of uh, a little bit polluted you know so but then uh, Kip Winger said uh, he goes I played him a song that I had recorded because I was still going in the studio 
And he said, you know, you ought to do a record on, on Frontiers. He said, let me see if I can get you the deal. And he did get me a deal. And at one point, uh, Serafino said, I never would have signed you if Kip didn't ask me to. And now I wish I didn't. So fuck you and never email me again. <laughs> so I thought that was a, I, just, well, I say, hey, take it easy, will you? You know, I say, relax, pal. You know? And so, but, but, you know, at the same time, when he got the music, when Serafino got the songs, he was blown away. He was blown away by the album and the music. So it shows you that what type of guy he is. You know, his heart is on his sleeve. And if he could, his fist would be in my face. So it's a kind of a strange thing. But, but so anyway, um, with, 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 with all that being said, when Kip said, do you want to do a record? I said, yes. And then, you know, Serafino, you know, let me in. It took me three years to do the record because of the process. It was quite a, uh, an involved process of me singing something and discovering that my voice was still there. And I was able to play, of course, because I never stopped practicing guitar. And I was singing a little bit. But, you know, when you're at the show, you know, when you're in front of a microphone, it's a whole different you know, because right. it's very revealing. You know, when you listen back, you'll go, I hit the notes. But, you know, uh, singers, by the way, have to be great actors because uh, they're reading a script. You know, I tell I tell uh, any of the people that, uh, you know, that um, I have at seminars or whatever, when I speak to younger musicians, I said, you have to spend time singing every word separately of every song. Because the word the is just as important as any other word. Because you have to know how you're going to articulate it. What is your voice? Like the, the lexicon for rock and how to pronounce stuff is Mick Jagger, you know. And if you listen to, um, uh, if you listen to Joan Jett, she's a perfect example. Put another diamond in, in, in the jukebox, baby. And that's all, that's all Mick Jagger, you know. He, he had that yeah. whole thing. So, um, so yeah, so I, ha I was in front of, oh, and by the way, the, 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 you, I, I have any of the people that I work with to read the script to me as a, as a scene from a movie because you have to act in other words you have to get inside the words and, and what they mean and if you overact it's not good you know if you overdo it of course you have to hit the notes but so that was a long process for me and you know so finally I got the record done and um, like I said uh, you know Serafino and, and a little bit more than Mario but they, they you know he loved the, the album and um, you know the, the strangest thing of it all is, you know, when I put the cover together, I had this notion that I wanted to have this, I saw this artist, his name is Michael Rosner, and he takes these very strange photos with, you know, girls that are completely inked up and and they wear different masks and everything. So I found this thing, it was like a, a virus mask. It was black leather, had spikes in, on it. It was made by this woman, her name's Miss G. Miss G Designs is her company on you can see her on uh, on Instagram. So I do the cover, and she's wearing this mask, and there's blood on the mask, you know. I called the album The New Normal, which is kind of prescient, if you think about it. This first song that we released was Beginning of the End, Say Goodbye to the World, you know. And, uh, you know, now when I look back, people look at that cover, and they go, did this just come out? I go, no, that was a year ago. And they get a little scared of me. I'm like this must evil be Nostradamus. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange, you know. But um, so you know, I got in there and and we we recorded the record. I was really very pleased with this album, more so than a lot of the other stuff that I've done, because I I kept things very honest, you know, through the record. And I was lucky to produce with this guy Alex Track, who's a tremendous musician, but you know, he also is very adept in the studio. He has a great studio. And so you can imagine three years in the studio, I'd get there at nine at night. It reminded me of when I was a kid. Sometimes we would start at 11 p.m. and I'd be there till like, you know, 2000 o'clock or I'd leave and the, the, the sun would be up, you know. And uh, so, you know, I'm really excited about that. And we, we have some videos coming out, you know, in the next uh, month or so. We're doing a director's cut of beginning of the end. Um, and then, um, you know, I have one that deals with domestic violence. It's a little bit of a political thing, but, but the video itself is very striking. And, and then we finally have one more that we're going to do uh, with this really great uh, female actress that we're going to we're going to put together so yeah i mean i'm really glad i came back and did it um i'm getting some people offering to have me do another another uh cd or another album and you know i i, I think i very well i'm actually interested in doing it um and so i'd like to maybe come at this as a artist that records and and does as many videos as i can uh and that's sort of the way that i'll present my stuff 
to the public. What I love about the uh, recent record is that um, you have just so many different styles, I feel like, on that album. Um, I love when a record obviously ties together, but you have heavier songs, you have more melodic tracks, you have, you know, it's kind of new metal kind of even sounding songs on there. Sure, Um, sure, yeah. And I think that's so interesting because I don't know about you, but sometimes when I listen to an album and it's just the same song over and over again, same like song I, over and over. I know, you know, an artist having a style, like, of course, but you know, you like to see some variety. And I feel like with the new normal, that's definitely evident. It's just a little bit of like almost touching kind of a little bit of like each subgenre of metal in a way. So I really enjoyed that. Just wanted to let you know that because I'm not sure if anybody had ever told you that before. Well, well yeah, no, I, I have gotten that. And, and, you know, it's funny, a lot of that is, Alice's fault because he looks at songs as a cinematic event so they require different things if you look at his albums his albums go in and out of different sort of theater in 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 these songs and so they require a different setting and so um you know and that's one of those things where you know for example on beginning to the end which is one of the heavier songs I really wanted Alice on it and I was blessed to get him I wanted Aoyama Hideki from uh, Baby Metal to play drums because it just sounded, his drumming sounds like this giant robot machine. It's just incredible. And then instead of putting the guitar solo where it would normally go, I asked uh, Alyssa White Glues to to drop into the song, kind of, you know, detonate the whole world. And if you listen to it, I mean, the amount of energy upgrade when she hits the ground is, is unbelievable. So, so yeah, you know, and that's the way. And we have another song called, let's say, Who We Are. That's a, it's kind of an acoustic song. And, you know, in that song, you can hear a lot because there's a lot of sort of production to it in terms of, you know, different sounds. Uh, I didn't do the normal thing with a piano and all that stuff. It's got a different feel to it. Instead of a guitar solo, I had this very uh, talented young artist, uh, her name's Kat Franich, uh, sing this middle section. She's the female voice of the song, you know, in terms of the lyrics and what the story is. So, yeah, I mean, if if you sit down and re- think that each thing that you do, to a certain extent, uh, is kind of a cinematic event, I love music on film. I love Hans Zimmer's work, uh, people like that, Danny Elfman. What, what it does to the visuals, the sort of interlacing, the, the influence between visuals and music, um, I, was, I was very aware of that while I was recording the record. So, like I said, I, it's, it's interesting that you notice it because it's very true. I mean, it all sounds like the same artist. I have some of my influences from way back in the day and then stuff that, you know, has happened to me, you know, recently and what I like. So uh, it, it's a little bit of a, a story on it. And, you know, the next album, I think, um, is going to go a little bit more, you know, in a radical direction, but you know, it'll still be related to this one. And talking about writing, you know, I've spoken to a bunch of people um, that I've interviewed and a lot of people, you know, have come to the consensus that, you know, they usually stay writing, you know, no matter what, whether they're writing a new record or just writing for fun. Uh, right. What is that like for you? Do you always just find yourself consistently writing, even if you know that it's not going to be going on a record? You know, do you take breaks from writing? Is it something that you only do when you feel like you might be putting out a record? Because I know for some people, it's kind of a way to stay sharp and you know practice those skills so you know what is that like for you yeah for for me I you know um creativity uh at at its at its very essence um you know blindsides me all the time in other words I'll be driving and suddenly you know I, I start thinking of a song and hearing it in my head and singing and I try to either record it or you know write something down without smashing my car into somebody else's so it, it is it is that kind of a situation where it's it's the sort I, I I I'm allowed at this point in my life to um, it's the luxury of uh, you know just letting it happen you know because um, you know with with for example with this whole uh, you know quarantine uh, bullshit that's going on I I ended up uh, you know I I'm still I I never you know the, my money flow never stopped you know for example so um, but but there are situations where you know when working with Desmond for example working with Paul Stanley or any of these people, Berlin, you're required to get your act together that moment. You have to be on your toes. And it's one of those things where it becomes a job at that point. So you have to develop your skills. And so if I have a song that's sort of in my head, I do go home and try to, you know, uh, the, the key is that you have the melody and you have a sort of a sense for the lyrics, but it's the tonal relationship between the melody and the chords that are a little bit more elusive for me. So it takes me a while. And sometimes that's why I do like co-writing. There's this uh, kid I write with, uh, Evan Magnus, 
and you know he always seems to put a strange voicing under the uh, under the uh, um, the melody. It's the same thing. That was one of the things, reasons I really like that band, uh, Filter. You know the song Skinny and and all those songs because um, the chords underneath are not sort of the expected chord instead of like, you know, an A minor, it'll be an F minor or some nine or something, some strange voicing on a keyboard or whatever. So, so yeah, uh, the discipline is, is, is essential, but I always allow the writing, the creative process to just sort of, you know, uh, punch me in the face and start you know moving forward yeah i think that's so interesting because i i feel like listening to music uh you know as i've started to talk to people um and different musicians i feel like initially i always thought that you know people just wrote when they're writing a record like that's just how it happens and um it's it's so cool just to see that you know people are just always it's the creative process like you said is just always going you know whether you have it's always going now now desmond if i would meet him at his place uh in Hollywood, this is during, you know, when I was doing Saints and Sinners, if we had 15 minutes, we would leave with a song. So, you know, he's, he's prolific in that sense, very disciplined. And when I say leave with a song, maybe it's not done, but I've written with people for two hours and we might've gotten you know, three words on a verse or something like that. For him, it's a job, you know, in, in, in every sense of the word. It's, it's, uh, it's his real estate financially, but it's what he does. And he brings uh, a very tremendous standard <coughs> and sort of a, a, a schedule, you know, to, to the show when you're there. Well, I'm very excited to hear the next record, whenever that might be. I always like to hear what you're up to and what you're doing. But before I let you go, I ask yep. you five different questions um, at the end of every single one of my interviews. You can kind of answer them rapid fire if you want. If you want to think about them, you can too. It's whatever. Uh, okay, I, I can answer the first one, steroids. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> They're just like uh, five questions that I just ask every single person that I interview. Um, I think that they're just super interesting and it's fun to see everybody's answers. Yeah, so the first one is if you weren't uh, in the profession that you currently are in, so, you know, being a guitar player, working in broadcasting, et cetera, um, what would you be doing, do you think? Well, it would be something that had to do with uh, graphic art. I'd like to, you know, be a comic book artist or, you know, right now I'm doing a tremendous amount of motion graphic stuff. And it's, it's, the visual aspect of it is, is extremely gratifying. The software is such now, although, you know, 20 years from now, it'll seem antiquated, but now it's pretty, pretty rapid, you know, with, with the um, programs like After Effects and Final Cut and stuff like that. So it would have to do with some sort of so, sort of graphic thing. Nice. And you even get to do some of that kind of in what you're doing now with like the videos. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, with the videos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so number two is what is something that you wish that everybody knew about you? really nice guy no no um uh geez well uh maybe, maybe the main thing was you know a lot of people were kind of upset that alice brought this it was that was the first time he brought somebody out and made him kind of center stage with him big muscle guy and the, the songs didn't sound like the classic records and all that stuff so maybe um you know people have to realize that i do hold the alice classic stuff in high regard you know glenn and uh, and michael and all those guys they're they're amazing people to me and and so you know i'm one of those guys the, the original band is always you know that's the yeah. one i sort of gravitate towards i can't help it so so yeah maybe maybe that i mean i didn't just walk in and stomp all over everybody you know they wouldn't allow that and you know alice is such a strong personality that he had a lot to do with the way that the music sounded. But, you know, just that, you know, that I, the, the original records that Alice did are very often the, the holy grail. So that's what yeah. it was based on. Yeah. Like for me, I view kind of all of Alice's albums as just kind of like chapters in his career and his story. Sure. The earlier records are completely different. I, you can't even compare them to Constrictor or Razor Fist. No. Or different time yeah. periods. Or even the stuff he's doing today, you know. Yeah, so, you yeah. can't. You can't compare Constrictor to like Paranormal or something. You know, it's yeah, it's yeah. different eras, different people, different writers, different a different culture. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's hard to compare. So I kind of just view it as different chapters. So when I heard Public Animal Number Nine, I was just going, "What the fuck? Just so good!" You know, it's the way he ends right. that song. You know, so how you're not gonna like sort of uh, you know do a uh, bow down and say you're not worthy? You know, so. <laughs> 
Uh, the third question is, if you were stranded on a desert island and you only yeah. had three records that you could bring with you to listen to, what would they be? Yeah, just my records because, you know, <laughs> they're fucking unbelievable. No, no. Um, uh, what would it be? Well, I, would, I think I would bring the new normal. I would bring uh, uh, Axis Bold as Love, you know, the, uh, the Hendrix record. And, um, you know, the third record, it might be, you know, everybody's going to say, well, wow, you know, what the fuck is that? But it might be uh, Now's the Time, which is uh, Sonny Rollins' record. That's a sax, that sax player. Take yeah. a look at Sonny. He, he was like, they, he had this incredible jazz career, right, when jazz was a lot more accepted. And he disappeared. And a famous uh, music writer, jazz uh, uh, columnist named Leonard Feather, was walking in Manhattan and he heard this phenomenal saxophone. And, and Sonny had been gone for years. And he went down and under a bridge. Sonny Rollins was there. And he had shaved his head into a mohawk. And this is like 1959 or something. He's just the guy. It's just... <laughs> So very strange guy. If you look him up, Sonny Rollins, you'll see, uh, you know, and, you know, he got to know me a little bit. You know, I was this goofy kid hanging around and he would talk to me and stuff like that. So it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, Mohawk is something that I'm sure was very unheard of in 1959. No. And I think, I know that you're thinking of doing it. You know, I think you're thinking of getting your own Mohawk. You look good in it. I'm not kidding. You. So. <laughs> you know, I liked your answer about bringing your own album, to be honest, because it's something you bring it. I made that. I'm proud of it. I'm going to bring it with me so I can listen to it forever. That's yeah. a good answer. <laughs> yeah, you listen to it going, hey, you did that pretty good. And occasionally you go, I don't know. I don't know if that wasn't so good. I, you know, let's skip that song. Yeah. No, geez, I love everything I do. <laughs> so the fourth question is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? To me? Yes. Yes. Um... I guess it would be, well, see, what I've learned is that uh, when you do drugs, okay, and you can, you can do weed, right? If you're smoking weed all the time, there's somebody who's trying to do the same thing you're doing. And weed's like a very, you know, that's not that much of a big deal. But there's somebody trying to do the same thing you're trying to do. And if, he's, if he or she are not doing that, they're flying past you. So it's the same thing. I mean, I, I, I sort of dabbled in a lot of stuff. I mean, there was a point where... Um, I was enjoying uh, heroin once in a while and I never got addicted to it. I would just kind of dabble in it or whatever, but you know, I never, I didn't really use a syringe or anything. I just kind of snorted and everything. Right. And you know, it, it felt pretty good, you know, but by the same token, that sort of period in my life, I was on stasis mode. Nothing was happening. It was very young when I was just doing it. Then. Nothing was going on. And so I noticed that and got myself out of it, but I wish I had never, really uh you know dabbled in all that stuff and, you know weed's a different thing you can do it once in a while you know if people can can uh, you know control themselves doing it but um i'd say you know just completely you should just uh, stay clean i think and then um i like to drive fast i like to meet people i'll be speaking at the masonic temple tonight if <laughs> you know i'm kidding <laughs> what the hell i was talking about just the <laughs> hey kids don't do drugs you know like, oh wow that guy's radical I mean, like, I talk about that with my friends um, sometimes. You know, we're talking, like, uh, one of my best friends, she's a bass player in a band. I mean, I've had her on the podcast before. She and I talk about it all the time is that, you know, it's just something that I've never wanted to get involved in. I'm, like, just, we're so focused on our goals and things that we're doing yeah. um, that, you know, I never want to have to rely on something like that or have that be a crutch. Or for her, you know, she's writing music and, you know, she's like, I never want to have to rely on a drug to be creative or to, right. you know, be inspired. Um, so it's very interesting how the times have changed because I don't know if I would have been saying that in 1987. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, geez, uh, you know, you walk into a club and somebody right. hits you in the face with a powder puff full of uh, cocaine you know right. it's just it was kind of a crazy thing but but i you know and that's one of the things i you know i hated that drug you know so I, I just did a couple of things uh but um but yeah you know i can tell by you uh, talking to you that you do reach you know tremendous highs uh in terms of you know what your love is and your passion is and what you do and everything and uh you know you can even tell you know i've done you know uh, few interviews so you, know, you can tell when somebody is you know the things that they're talking about uh comes from the heart you know what i mean and they they it, it's that sort of a thing and, and i always look at it like you know alice and i used to talk about how 
performances were completely different depending on the audience. You know, there's a standard that we would always meet, you know, and the people that, that do interviews that we meet that are sort of legit, they're real. It's, it's an essential part of everything we do. And, and so, you know, the value of it to us is, you know, as a musician is, is tremendous because, you know, we review stuff all the time. I'm, everybody does it. They listen to a song. I like this. I don't like that. It's, it's when, you know, sort of these other agendas get stuck in our heads and they influence what we like or what we do. So I get the sense from you that, that yours is kind of a very pure flow and that doesn't require any help, I don't think. So it's, it's oh. awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. You know, I, I always, I always try to just be passionate. That's how I started, you know, doing this to begin with. I just yeah. had a passion, you know, it, it's never, it's never been about wanting to talk to rock stars or like, no, I don't get that sense. Yeah, it's, it's just, I love music and I want yeah. to be able to, you know, talk to the people who made my favorite music and, and share their knowledge with people just like me. So I'm glad that it comes across. I appreciate that. No, it does come across. And I can tell, you know, when the interview ends, you're going to go, what jerk. No, no, I'm kidding. No, no, <laughs> no, no. I can, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you, you, that's, that's okay. No, but no, but I, it, it's, um, it's immediately evident. So it's, it's one of those things, you, you know, it's not hard to spot, you know, so it's cool. Thank you. Uh, so the last question, it's kind of a fun question. doesn't take too much okay. thought. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? <laughs> oh, my, my head just went to an awful place. So, you know, uh, let me see. Uh, what would it be? A superpower? Hmm. Geez, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day. And, you know, you wonder where these superheroes came from. You wonder if way back in, you know, the, the history of mankind that they were there before. You know, because everything that happens in art has, a, has an example a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, you can see something that's almost exactly the same. So, uh, you know, it might just be that, that we are all superheroes. We just don't know how to access, you know, that stuff, you know. Uh, um, but uh, what would my one super, I, I think I would like to be able to uh, fly, mostly because of the exit. You know, you could say, all right, everybody, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, like that would be awesome, you know. Instead of like tripping on your way out the door, you know, it's like, oh, I forgot my keys. You know, it's much better if you could just sort of take off. So I think flying would be the thing, just for the exit. Just for the exit. Yeah. Super cool exit. Totally works. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I say, all right, I'll see you later. You know, I just I come up with all these moves, you know. Well, thank you so much for taking the time this morning for you to join me on the podcast. I always love talking to you and having you on. Um, you're always welcome. And uh, I would love to maybe even follow up with you when you release the video or, uh, you know. Yeah, no, I have a video coming up that we're going to put out that I would like you to be part of the uh, debut. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think there, there's no better place for it than, than you. Of course, I have the, uh, you know, like I said, the director's cut and we're debating which one's going to come first. So, you know, we'll definitely get it to you first and, and you can uh, get an exclusive on it. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, once you, you know, get rolling with a new album, I'd also love to, uh, you know, talk to you about that as well. So yeah, it's always a pleasure having you on and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you.